Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio listeners. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true, minus the alien abduction dreams. That is not cool at all. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. It's the Odd, Odd, Odd to New Finland. Ghostly greetings from your host, Jonathan. Mysteries, ghosts, monsters, and lore. East Coast esoterica and so much more. If it's up to you, friend, it's on the up to you farm line. <laughs> Ghostly greetings from the oldest city in North America. I'm your host, John Mallard, bringing you the best in East Coast esoterica. You, my friends, have stumbled upon the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast for the month of May 2017. Oh, uh, thanks so much, guys, for once again jumping on your phone, maybe, or your maybe even your iPod, and just thanks a million for taking a chance on this podcast, you know? Your monthly paranormal variety show. Gotta love it. Because you know what? You're wonderful. You're a masterpiece. You're beautifully made. Important to people because you're important to me. You're highly favored by your creator, whether that is a god or by the law of averages and physics working in tandem. You're thirsty for knowledge, my friend, and addicted to the wonder... You, my friend, are an oddball, and here on this show, your family, and we are one. This is episode 40 of the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, your monthly paranormal variety show, and let me tell you, it's going to be a great show. We're actually going to spend a lot of time today going into the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast mailbag, though. I have gotten an obscene amount of just emails this last month. It's crazy. And I really, really love getting emails because it really helps me drive my show. And what I mean by that is it just really, really helps me, uh, how if we put this, it, it kind of gives me a co-host in a way because <laughs> it gives me someone to feed off. Yeah. Like I think getting feedback about the shows and I think about uh, just reading emails on air about different questions or comments people have, I think it's just great. And uh, we've actually got a lot of ground to cover for the mailbag. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to jump right into the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast mailbag and uh, go ahead and get started. All right. The first uh, email I got for the mailbag is from a fellow by the name of Joseph Capusta. And uh, he wrote, uh, I just listened to your interview on Paratruth Radio and I enjoyed it very much. A special interest to me is your open mind to combining science and faith but I'm especially on board with your views on EVP, or electronic voice phenomena. I just wanted to add that the biggest kick I get from EVPs is when there is a connection and intelligent reply that validates historical facts that has happened to me. I just downloaded your book, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you, Joe. Wow. And you know, just first off, Joe, thanks so much for taking the time. I I really do appreciate that. Like I mentioned before, it uh, it helps. It gives me something to talk about when someone emails me. And you know, you're so right. EVP is just... Uh, it's just really, you know, wonderful for me, regardless. And I mean, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I wrote a book on the subject, but you're absolutely right. I think, I think it just really rings true some of the stories. And as soon as you said, uh, you know, historical facts and EVP, I, I can't help but think about some of the time I've spent at Admiralty House Communications Museum in Mount Pearl, Newfoundland. And uh, right off the hop, um, I'm just completely transported to one of the first times I actually talked about the EVPs I captured there. It was a, uh, a get-together with the peoples of the board there, and I showed some of my findings. And, uh, you know, the ghost story about the place is about a lady by the name of Anne. And, uh, you know, the ghost stories that she's riding are horse around the ground sometimes. So... It's a really strange, uh, <laughs> it's a really strange story, but anyway, I managed to capture two EVPs back to back. They're both spirit box PV EVPs, actually. They're just really strange. The first is, this is Anne, and then it's followed by, our home was burned. And I'll tell you the relevance after that, once I let you guys actually listen to the EVP. So, have a little listen and, uh, see if you can hear this. Thank <laughs> you. 
So you can go back and listen to that again. That was This Is Anne. So that was actually really interesting. That that EVP there said our home was burned. So what the heck do these two things have to do with each other? You know, we're we're you know we're pretty stoked to hear this is Anne because well I was actually searching for the ghost of Anne Pearl, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it actually wound up being something really interesting during the presentation of the EVPs. Uh, after the presentation was over. One of the people who work at the museum, John Rich, came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I think I solved the mystery of the Our Home Was Burned, the one that came in after This Is Anne. And he took me to a placard and uh, just blew my mind. On the placard in one of the halls, he wrote back, he said, check this out. And on the placard, it actually says, um, tragedy struck Anne once again in her life when her home was burned to the ground. And uh, I thought that was just... Really, really, really cool. It kind of links the historic facts. And you know what, Joseph? You're absolutely right. I think it's fascinating. And I can't think of a cooler way to talk about the history of all the buildings and stuff that are around us than to think about EVP. I mean, God, I just... I just think it's a great way to do it. So, uh, yeah, super appreciate that email. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll move along to the next one. Thank you again, Joseph. Keep listening, bud. We love it. Um Got a message on one of my episodes from uh, Marta Selway. She says, very simply, love it. <laughs> so, you know, in the mailbag, e- emails and messages and stuff like that don't have to be long. And let me tell you, getting something like the words love it written on something, it, it really just fuels me to keep doing what I do. Because I love this podcast and I love the feedback. Um, got more emails, though. I don't know if you guys remember, a couple episodes ago, I had a fellow by the name of Mark McNichol on. And, uh, you know, Mark was a producer and uh, it's just a, a really wonderful guest. You guys can look back uh, and see what episode that was. It's back in the notes back there. Just uh, go on to Podbean and check out the Out of Newfoundland Apparel podcast and just kind of scroll back and find us. But uh, anyway, Mark was on the show before and he wrote me uh, an email and uh, it was really out of the blue. But uh he is doing something absolutely fantastic. And, uh, I just, I just, I just gotta read this email because I think you guys might be interested. It says, Hi John, after attending a screening of the inspiring Andy Whitfield film, Be Here Now, the first thing I did was register to run my local can- marathon for cancer research. He says, if you haven't seen the film, it's on Netflix. It's once again called Be Here Now. He wrote, uh, please also consider pledging something for my run to help motivate me toward and, uh, you know, towards crossing the finish line on Sunday, the 28th of May in Manchester. Here is my fundraising page, and I'll be sure to uh, link the fundraising page to the show notes to wherever you find this show, guys. Uh, great cause. I mean, obviously, cancer hits me right between the eyes because my father right now is suffering from cancer. So, uh, you know, it uh, it really it really touches me when someone does this. And let me tell you, there's a big difference between running a road race and running a marathon. Like, we're talking like... 20 miles, man. That's, that's a long, that's a long, long marathon to run. So if you guys can, if you find it your hearts, you might be able to support, uh, support Mark and his endeavor here. You know, he's going to be running that marathon, uh, before Sunday, May 28th. You guys can make a Twitch donation. I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. Good luck, Mark. We love you in Newfoundland, buddy. You're running for all the right reasons. Thank you so much for doing that. I think it's, uh, I think it's very, very inspiring. Um, speaking of inspiring, you know, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny how, like, I, I get in contact with people, and I got another completely random email this month, and uh, I think you guys could listen to this one. I think you're going to like this, especially for anybody out there who's, uh, you know, deeply into the paranormal, who might be an investigator. This is for you guys out there, okay? So have a listen to this. It says, Hi, John. My name is Sam Charlton. I'm an associate producer with Our House Media, a large production company based out of Toronto. You might be familiar with our with some of our paranormal shows, Paranormal Survivor, Haunted Case Files, and Paranormal Investigators. We are actively searching for stories for a new show, Scariest Night of My Life. What makes the show different is that the stories told by contributors will have taken place over the course of one night, as opposed to the more drawn-out hauntings and isolated incidents we sometimes encounter in this field. Imagine the show 24, but with tw- with paranormal entities and spirits instead of terrorists and Keith or Sutherland. <laughs> I love how any reason to say Keith or Sutherland's name on the podcast is hilarious, by the way. Uh, back to the email. It's quite a particular set of requirements. I figured with the amount of experience and followers you have, that it'd be a great source to inquire to. Um, 
We will require contributors to sit and tell their story back to us. We're leaning away from investigator stories as our company makes two investigator series already. That said, if the featured person wasn't an investigator at the time, it could pass. If you know anyone that you think would have a story to tell us, I'd love to hear. We will likely have more investigator series too. It's good for us to establish contact with as many possible from the States and Canada for future projects. And he writes sincerely, Sam Charlton. And, uh, you know, I think that's wonderful. Thank you, Sam. Of course, I, uh, (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm I'm the one person in the world he probably wouldn't be wanting because I'm a big believer in visiting the same places over and over again and getting repeatable data. But that's beside the point. If there's anybody out there who listens to this show right now who would maybe like to contact Samuel, okay, you know, this is your chance to do so. And uh, <laughs> you have a reason to, all right? And uh, once again, uh, his email is... S. Charlton, so S C H A R L T O N at ourhousemedia.com. Our O U R House H O U S E Media M E D I A dot com. Reach out to Sam Charlton. Maybe you've got the perfect person to tell a ghost story for this guy. Maybe get on TV. So how do you like that? <laughs> I'm gonna get you guys on TV. There you go. Um yeah, we'll move along. Ah, uh, now. Am I done with all the all the emails? I think so. No, wait, wait, no, no, I got another one. Oh, this is so cool. You guys are going to love this. Okay, so huh, I thought I was getting spammed in my email, I'm not going to lie. And uh I got a I got a message from a Rio Stow. Um and it was complete gibberish and I didn't understand what it was. It just said uh, and I'm going to do my best. I'm probably going to butcher this. It is Japanese, but I'm going to I'm going to try my best to read this to you guys. It said Anata wa sora fudo deso, chefi ni watashi no senjo. And of course, I went right to Google Translate and put it in, and it said, translates to, you are soul food, my compliments to the chef. I'd had somebody write in Japanese to me and tell me that my show is soul food, my compliments to the chef. In other words, completely praising me up. Oh man, I, I thought that was wonderful. Uh, a very, a very unique way of letting me know you listen to my show and you care. Uh, you know, I, I never really got a feel for if this person was actually Japanese or someone who just knew Japanese and wanted to say something nice. So I've been walking around all week wondering in the back of my head, wow, is this person actually from Japan? Do people in Japan listen to the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast? I know people from Africa and I know people from Australia and I know people from Wales and I know people from Ireland and Scotland and I know people from all over the world, really. Uh, some Russians, too, listen to the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast because I can see that. But uh, I, I don't have access to know if it's coming from Japan or not. So that would be really interesting. Maybe I'll get a chance to uh, maybe hear back. <laughs> I think that would be, uh, be really, really cool. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Enough with the mailbag. I hope uh, I hope I hit all the nails on the head here. And uh, hopefully... Uh, We'll get down now with something else. Let's move on to the paranormal news. Before I jump into that, I want to remind you guys that tonight's show is brought to you by Cutting Edge Wrestling. Wrestling that leaves a mark. And, uh, you know, they're my sponsor. Thank you, guys. They're your local professional wrestling organization. Guys, go check them out. They've been around forever. And uh, there's a reason for that. They definitely provide an edgier, you know, Shall we say TV mature style show? Lots of blood, guts, and gore, and cursing, and swearing, and all that good stuff. So get out and see it. It's a more adult show. Um, show's also brought to you by Donuts and Dragons Board Game Cafe. They're over on Stavanger Drive. They opened up last week. Uh, I think it was wonderful. Very, very happy for my friend Gary Tippett, who just opened up this business. Stop by, have a coffee, play some Dungeons and Dragons. My favorite is Clue, but whatever. Go by. Get your friends together, maybe have a little board night, and uh, you know, in between shop and take a little break. I think it's a, I think it's a great idea, and I think it's a lot of fun. So there you go. Thank you, Cutting Edge Wrestling. Thank you, Jonas and Dragons Game Board Cafe for supporting the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Moving right along, the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal News. Oh man, I love it when Newfoundland makes the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast news. We're in the news. Yep, that's right. You probably heard it, but you know what? I'll let the gal from CTV. You know, news channel actually tell you guys, Beverly Thompson's going to deliver the next story. Thanks, Bev, wherever you're to. And uh, I think this is awesome because Newfoundland had a giant come to visit this month. Yeah, a giant iceberg. Take a listen. 
Thanks for joining us. I'm Beverly Thompson. We want to show you a beautiful scene off the coast of Newfoundland. A large iceberg has become a major tourist attraction, visible from the shores of Fairland. The town has seen an influx of people coming to see the natural beauty. Charlie Dunn is a Fairland resident and captured that drone footage. He joins me now from Fairland, Newfoundland. Good to have you on the program. Hello. Hi, Beverly. How are you? Well, I'm good, thanks. You're used to seeing icebergs, but tell me what your reaction was when you put the drone up and, and saw this one. Well, we see icebergs on a regular basis. This is really nothing new to people in Newfoundland, and especially where I'm living here in Fairland. We're on what's referred to as the tail of Iceberg Alley, which comes from, starts at the coast of Labrador, heads down past Newfoundland, and we're on basically on the tip, a tip edge of that. So we see uh, icebergs on, on a regular basis, and uh, you know, like this one, although it's you know like a, it's causing a lot of a lot of hustle and bustle here in the community. <laughs> uh, it's rather tall, uh, not the biggest iceberg that I've seen, but uh, it's the most people that I've seen come to look at the iceberg. <laughs> and it's really interesting because this iceberg is absolutely massive, and he kind of downplays it a little bit when he's talking there. But let me tell you, this thing is like the size of a six or seven story building. It's absolutely massive. And remember, what we see on the top of the water is only, you got it, the tip of the iceberg. This thing is massive, and it makes you wonder, you know, there's one thing I don't think. You know, that, that that's paranormal. There's one thing I know that I think there truly is science behind, and that is one thing... And I hate to say it, but I really do believe that global, you know, temperatures are raising. I believe there's something to this whole heating up of the world because icebergs and stuff like that are very common in Newfoundland. But our weather is just all over the place lately, especially the last five years. And, uh, you know, if you don't believe in global warming, you know, all you got to do is look out and see gigantic icebergs like that coming. And, you know, the fact that they're becoming more prevalent in Newfoundland, that should be a big warning sign to people. I, I really hope that it's not... Uh, the first sign of the end. But anyway, it's well worth a look. I shared that link actually to the giant iceberg on the, the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Facebook group, also the Life After Death Society one. So check it out. It's actually really cool. It went pretty well viral all over the world, but uh, if you hadn't checked it out, go see it. It's really interesting to see houses and in the background, a gigantic iceberg that just makes them look like little dinkies and uh, playhouses. <laughs> I thought it was really, 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 really cool. Okay, so you think that picture's cool? Well, let's just say science might have snapped something even cooler this month. Oh, yeah. First ever image of dark matter has been revealed. Scientists in Ontario have compiled an image of dark matter filaments connecting two galaxies together. Cool. The existence of this enigmatic form of matter, which is thought to account for up to 85% of the mass of the universe, remains one of the most important unsolved mysteries in modern physics. Even observing dark matter directly has proven to be a challenge, but now two researchers at the University of Waterloo believe that they have succeeded in creating a composite image showing dark matter filaments bridging two galaxies located 4.5 billion miles away. The impressive image took advantage of a technique known as weak gravitational lensing, which causes the appearance of distant objects to warp slightly under the influence of an unseen mask. For decades, researchers have been predicting the existence of dark matter filaments between galaxies that act like a web-like superstructure connecting galaxies together, said study author Mike Hudson, an astronomy professor at the University of Waterloo. This image moves us beyond predictions to something we can see and measure. <laughs> You think? <laughs> like, I think that's amazing. You know, I, I love being alive in this time because science is just discovering more and more and more. And the more science discovers, the better, really. I think it's wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I even said in the opening tonight that, you know, my show is for everyone, whether you're a science-minded person or a very spiritual person. I, uh, you know, I get the question all the time from people. Why, why do you put your paranormal show in religion and spirituality and not, you know, something more science based because you tell, you tell a lot of science with that. And, and the reason for that is because we still don't know what's going on with these stories. It's still under the realm of the weird and the strange. Okay. So there you go. The reason why my show <laughs> is, uh, underneath religion and spirituality is because it's about, you know, having faith in the weirdness. How about that? <laughs> anyway, moving right along. Okay, Rochester, what the hell's going on in your graveyard? The White Lady Spooks Park Visitors in Rochester. A tree in Juron Eastman Park sports a ghostly visage thanks to the destructive effects of Mother Nature. The phenomenon 
which at a distance looks like a wailing specter with its arms outstretched, is actually an area of torn up tree trunk caused by a recent spat of strong wind. The airy human-like form, however, is particularly fitting as the park has long been home to a white lady or Lady of the Lake legend dating all the way back to the 19th century. The story goes that the ghost of a woman wanders the park in search of her daughter, who was murdered by a group of hoodlums. Depending on which version of the tale you read, it is also said that the woman either died of a broken heart or killed herself out of grief for her loss. There have been several sightings of the lady's ghost in the park over the years, with the legend becoming so well known that it was even featured in a 1988 movie, Lady in White. I think it's spooky. It's definitely pretty creepy, said park visitor Jamal Bowler. And I've seen pictures online of this thing, and uh, from a distance, it is really weird looking. (laughs) It's really strange. And uh, hmm, I wonder, could this spirit be trying to communicate with us, or was it just a gust of wind? (laughs) You guys be the judge on that one. (laughs) Oh, man. Anyway, okay. You know, for many episodes, you guys have heard me tell, like, I just just love dinosaurs. Anything dinosaur, weird or strange found... I am so putting it on the podcast. So here comes another dinosaur story for you guys. Fossilized dinosaur eggs unearthed in China. Discovered near Foshan in the southeast of the country, the eggs date back over 70 million years. The well-preserved fossils, which were found in red sandstone approximately 8 feet beneath the surface, belong to a species of plant-eating dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period. We found five eggs. Three were destroyed, but they are still visible, said Kwai Chang from the Guanhongs Archaeological Institute. The other two had their imprints on the stone. The eggs were round in shape, belonging to the Phytophagus dinosaur. The region in which the eggs were found has become synonymous with prehistoric discoveries. There are two things special about the Sanchu Basin. One, it's rich in minerals. Two, is that it's rich in fossils like dinosaur eggs, said Foshan's chief geologist Lu Jiangzhong. You guys have got to check this out. Fossilized dinosaur eggs on Earth in China. It is badass. And you know I love dinosaurs, and it's really weird, and it's really creepy, and you guys got to check it out. Because, you know, dinosaurs, you know, let's face it, they really are, well, I can't say living, but they were once upon a time living monsters. It's true. (laughs) Oh, my God. I just went over the whole reason why my podcast, you know, fits into religion and spirituality. And here's another reason, too. The Bible is full of crazy paranormal stuff. And there's giants in there. There, there, there. There's people parting the Red Sea. There's there's people walking on water. People raising from the dead. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on in the Bible. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean crazy stuff still doesn't happen to this day. The Virgin Mary statue cries tears of blood is my next story. Hundreds of people have been flocking to Argentina to witness what some are calling a modern miracle. The figurine, which belongs to a family in the country's south of the province, attracted a great deal of attention after its owners revealed on a local radio station that it had been crying tears of blood. But are the tears really a miracle? Priest Julio Raul Mendez, who believes that the statue should be properly investigated by the church, has warned that people should not jump to conclusions. After all, crying statues have been cropping up everywhere over the last few years. The first thing the church does is to do a scientific analysis to see there is a natural explanation, he said. Only then the possibility of supernatural phenomena is considered. So there you have it. Even the church is saying this might not be the real deal there, (laughs) which is really interesting too. But the idea that a statue can cry, like, other than being, like, I'm not really a Doctor Who fan, but even I know who the Weeping Angels are. I just think of that stuff, you know? (laughs) Just the weirdness surrounding it. Oh, man. Anyway. Uh, I thought it was kind of cool, the, the idea that, you know, is it possible that these inanimate objects somehow portray human qualities to communicate with us? It's it's not a far thing to, to think, if you believe in ghosts, that these idols and stuff like that could maybe even do something similar to that. So, an interesting thing. Uh, you know, what can I say? We had gigantic icebergs just, you know, pretty much crashing into Newfoundland here. We had the first ever image of dark matter revealed. Yep, that's right. We finally got it on camera. We had the white lady showing up in a Rochester graveyard, fossilized dinosaur eggs unearthed in China, and the Virgin Mary statue is crying in Argentina, tears of blood. I hope, I hope she wasn't a Detroit fan like I am. I can see why she probably would cry red tears. (laughs) Guys, all these stories have been odd to Newfoundland. All right. You know what? It's almost time for oddities, but first, let's check in with our old friend, Laura Gilbert. Oh, yeah, it's time for the MUFON Minute. 
And she has a very special anniversary version. That's right. Laura has been with me on my show now for a full year. It's so good to have a partner in crime. She's an absolute doll. And she's always on time with her stuff. She records it. She sends it to me. I clean it up. I put music in it. I produce it. But you know what? She does put her heart and soul into what she does. And uh, you're going to hear that now. Laura Gilbert in the MUFON Minute is coming right at you. Thanks, John. Welcome to your MUFON Minute for May 2017. Whew, what a busy April it has been. We welcomed a new furry friend to our family. Furry friend number three. Welcome to Thor, our big goofy boy. I also believe that this is my one year anniversary on the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. A special thanks to John for his continued support. Boys, as nice as he sounds on the podcast, he is truly ten times nicer in real life. It has been a joy and a wonderful experience. Thanks for being my paranormal friend, John. If we took a look at the numbers for 2017 thus far, we have seen over 1,600 worldwide reports into the case management system for MUFON. 253 of these have been classified as case closed unknown, which are the potentially true unidentified flying objects. This past month also saw NASA announce evidence that hydrothermal activity on the floor of an ice-covered ocean on Saturn's moon Enceladus is most likely creating methane from carbon dioxide. This means that there may be some indication of possible habitable zones within the ocean. These hydrothermal vents are similar to Earth's deep sea vents, with their curious critters like the lipstick-like giant tube worms and the extremely complex ecologies. It is important to note that although there is the possibility of it being habitable, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is anyone at home right now. What Cassini has found is that there's evidence that there may be locations on this moon that are very similar to places on Earth where life is known to exist. All that has been found are these possible similarities, but very exciting possibilities. We also have yet another interesting story from Roger Marsh on the openminds.tv site. According to case 82 950, a witness was outside at the corner of Allegheny and Kensington in Philadelphia, waiting for the bus on April 3rd. It was a lovely morning, and I was looking at the sky and clouds and saw a black object quite high, the witness stated. I was facing north, northwest. My first thought was that it was some debris floating on the air currents, but... It was not just floating along. It was moving quite slowly from east to west. The witness described the object. The object was dark black, shaped like a wide diamond or a square object on a corner. It did not appear to reflect light. However, I noticed a light that flashed about four times in the ten minutes or so that I was looking at it. The witness then decided to get a second opinion. I asked a young woman who was also waiting for the bus if she saw it, and she said yes. I asked her if it looked like a helicopter. She said she didn't think so. I'm afraid I didn't get her name, but if I see her again, I will ask. I did try to take some photos, but I don't believe they show much since the object was up so high. And I think quite distant. I'm attaching the photos from my phone. You can see these photographs at openminds.tv, but it is important to be cautious of any UFO photos, and this case is still under investigation. But it's still a very interesting story and a very unusual shape. When you go into woods for May 2-4, while you're shoveling the snow off your tent, don't forget to keep your eyes to the skies. You could see something very special, and it may not be from all that Captain Morgan and Vienna sausages. If you do, don't forget to report it to www.mufon.com. For more information about MUFON in Newfoundland and Labrador, please be sure to check out the Newfoundland UFO Network on Facebook. Thanks so much, John. Thank God. It's time.
time for oddities. Alive, it's alive, it's alive! Boy, that escalated quickly. I want to believe. Welcome to the desert of the real. Oddities. Alright guys, welcome to Oddities, 10 very strange facts that are true about an even stranger and odd world. Oh, we're going to get really into it this time. Everybody loves Oddities, I love Oddities. Real facts that are really weird. Here it comes, number one, did you know you are more likely to die from a falling coconut than a shark attack? Hmm, that's interesting. (laughs) So... How am I getting hit in the head with a coconut in Newfoundland? You know, we're in eastern Canada. We're pretty much Arctic. I should go buy a lotto ticket. I really should. <laughs> we, uh, maybe not. Did you know the chance of you dying on the way to get a lottery ticket is actually greater than your chance of winning? So you're basically saying that I have the choice between, you know, getting hit on the head with a coconut or being killed by a shark, more than likely the shark because there's no coconuts in Newfoundland, or getting killed on the way to get my lotto ticket as opposed to, you know what, you know what, you know what? These two oddities, they suck. All right? They suck. <laughs> Next one is, our eyes are always the same size from birth, but our nose and ears never stop growing. Do you guys know that? Your eyes don't actually grow? Yeah. Yeah. Your eyes are actually fully formed when you're born, and uh, your face grows around the eye. This is really interesting. It's a really interesting idea. Did you know the last time the Chicago Cubs won the World Series, the Ottoman Empire still existed? Hmm, interesting. Did you know Elvis Presley got a C in his 8th grade music class? Elvis Presley, the king, got a C in his music class. Just goes to show you. Just because I never listened much in my religion class and my philosophy class doesn't mean I'm not an awesome host of the Hot the Newfoundland Parenthood podcast. Did you know the average person consumes a pound a pound of insects per year, mostly mixed in with other foods. Gross. So I eat bugs. A pound of bugs a year. Great. Did you know Coca-Cola would be green if coloring wasn't added to it? Oh, man. I love the color green, but that just grosses me right out. Makes you think I'm like drinking Scope or something. Did you know the average mattress doubles in weight over the course of 10 years due to... Acu- oh, God. This can't be real. This is a goddamn nightmare. Okay, here, uh, uh, guys. The average mattress doubles in weight over the course of 10 years due to accumulation of dust mites and dust mite poop. And I just hurled all over my computer. (sighs) Did you know the United States, Burma, and Liberia are the only countries in the world that have not officially adopted the metric system as the standard of measurement? Hmm. Come on, guys, get with it. Did you know... Earth is the only planet not named after a god. Ha! Huh, that's actually really interesting. <laughs> Wait a second. Pluto's named after the god Pluto and not the dog from Disney? Ah. Dude, I was totally wrong about that. Last oddity for tonight. Did you know cows have best friends and experience stress when they are removed from them? Oh, Poor Bessie. She's all upset. You want to know why? Because her good Finn Clarence. Yep. He's hamburgers now. <laughs> Guys, it's almost time for tonight's guest, even though he already knows he's almost up. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Don't you dare go away. The following podcast is brought to you by Newfie EVP, talking with the dead in Newfoundland. Jump on Amazon.ca today and get your free sample of the best-selling ebook in Unexplained Mysteries. And welcome back to the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. My guest tonight was born with a very rare psychic gift. He not only has the ability to hear the voices of spirit guides, guardian angels, ascended masters, and loved ones on the other side, but he can also see them and talk with them. Ever since he was a little boy, his earliest memories are of talking and playing with his invisible friends. He later came to understand that these invisible friends were guardian angels, spirit guides, fairies, elves, and even his loved ones on the other side. Featured on Psychic Detectives, where he helped solve a double homicide murder, he was also on William Shatner's Weird or What, and has been on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox News. But nothing could prepare the world for when this man actually became famous. 
when he predicted the tragic Oklahoma City bombing on national radio. Not not a couple of months, not a couple of weeks, 90 minutes before it happened. And ever since then, he's been in great demand. So you can imagine, I've been waiting a real long time to get this guy on my podcast. And you know what? It's my pleasure to bring to you, my listeners, the world's most foremost psychic, Tana Hoy. Tana, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing a lot better now that I got you on, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, first and foremost, Tina, I just got to say, I'm going to be honest, I don't have a whole lot of psychics on my show. There's many different reasons for that, okay? Um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the main reasons is that I only do a monthly show. <laughs> so I try to have ghost hunters and, and, and people from Wiccan culture, and I try to have people from just all different walks of life. So I'm glad we finally got on the, uh, shall we say, on the same level here. Thanks for coming oh, thank on. You. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. And uh, I'm pretty excited, actually, for a couple of different reasons. My foremost reason is this. I love the idea that people have this gift the first thing it says on your on your site is that this is a gift, a very rare psychic gift. Tell me a little tiny bit about, well, how you see this and how you hear this. This must be just very hard for people to relate to. So I hope by now that you've kind of got that down pat. I would love to hear about the process. How do you get these messages from the other side? Well, the uh, psychic, the, the rare gift for me is that you know there's a, a lot of psychics. They can uh, see spirit guides or they can talk to spirit guides and guardian angels and they can and and loved ones uh, i was born with a very rare gift of actually being able to physically see them so i can see them as clearly as i could see you if you were standing here in front of me talking to me and as a child this was very very confusing because i remember we used to go to the mall i used to go to the mall with my parents and uh, i would see a lot more people than everybody else did and I didn't realize this until I didn't realize until later, you know, that everybody else didn't see what I was seeing and how I as I grew up, how I learned to distinguish, which, you know, as kids, you don't think about these things. But as I got older, how I learned to distinguish in the beginning who were actually physically there and who were there, who was walking wherever I was through the spirit in the spirit world was by their clothing and the way they were dressed. So, you know, people, of course, who were dressed like everybody else were physical beings. And people that were dressed, you know, if someone looked like Davy Crockett walking through the ball, well, then I would know that was a spirit guide or someone, you know, had on a full headdress. In war paint, I would know those were spirit guides or if someone had wings, I would know they were angels. But as a child, I didn't realize this. You know, as kids, we're very innocent. We don't, <clears throat> we don't always realize, you know, we don't think about those things. I also thought everybody had psychic ability as a kid. I thought everybody could see and, and talk to and, and hear guides and angels talk to them. And it wasn't until I got older, you know, I thought everyone had this gift. It wasn't until I got a little bit older that I learned that I was very different. So <clears throat> it was really a, it was something I was born with. It wasn't anything I really ever had to develop. I was just naturally born with it. So it was a very long learning process for me of, of not learning how to develop it, but learning how to deal with it, how to, uh, you know, for example, the spirit guides, how to be able to know who are real and who, who other people are seeing and who people aren't seeing. And also the other big learning thing for me was uh, when I was a kid, it was very scary for other kids. So I learned at a very young age to be very careful about the kind of things that I saw and shared with other kids because kids minds and mentalities are always ready for that kind of stuff <laughs> of course of course i mean let's be honest this does fit into the realm of the paranormal for a reason now me personally i do think that we all have this gift i think it happens to us by accident sometimes we have deja vu and sometimes we just get guttural feelings about people we don't know or situations how do you feel mm -hmm. about those things do you think everybody out there has a psychic gift Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. I have something that I call that I a theory that I had actually created or came up with that I call or devised that I call the caveman theory. And it's it, it proves that everybody has psychic ability. When we were first when we were cavemen, we were reduced to grunts and groans. We had no way. You know, we had no language. We had no speech. How did we you know it was a reality when we were cavemen? If we would come home and our family had been eaten by animals it was a reality that when we were out hunting, if we ran into other cavemen, 
especially with other cavemen. If you're, if you're, you know, we were, if you're, we're gatherers and hunters, and we're out with our little group of people, we run into another caveman. How do we know if that caveman is is going to be a friend or going to be somebody that's going to harm us? I mean, today we have language, we can talk, you know, we have senses. Our brain is much more developed today than it was then. So then, how did they know? Because there were only grunts and groans. And that was, it had to be intuition. It had to be an intuitive feeling. You know, you've heard the thing of hair raising up on the back of your neck. You know, we were very hairy back then. <laughs> so they were paying, they were paying attention to their feelings, to the hair on their, the back of their neck raising up literally. And so people had to have intuitive senses and feelings. They had to know, you know, if it was safe to leave the cave that day or not. Man relied on his intuition. And then what happened as time, as, as we grew and progressed and evolved and as technology has advanced, today we don't worry about coming home and, and seeing our family eaten by wild beast. We don't worry about, you know, finding food or where to go to find food or not to find food. We've got lots of stores and supermarkets. So what's happened is <clears throat> because of the advancement of technology, we don't have to deal with or worry about those things anymore. Ah, so, so we have we've had to rely less on our psychic ability. That's really interesting. In a way, we kind of by by evolving more, you know, with technology and our use of tools, that we've kind of de-evolved on a psychic or spiritual level. Correct? We yeah, we just quit focusing on it. So yeah. since we're all descendants of cavemen and women, um, <clears throat> all of us, we've got <clears throat> excuse me, we have psychic ability. So what I tell people. You're not learning to develop your psychic ability. That's kind of a misconception. You're actually learning to reconnect with and reawaken and understand what's always been a part of you. Oh, that's so beautiful. It, it gives, it fills me with hope because, you know, I'll be honest. I've always kind of wished I could talk to people who maybe have crossed over, but, uh, you know, it, it's great to know that there's somebody out there who who already has that gift. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of talking to somebody, you know, <laughs> I'll be honest. It, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes an army to raise a really, really popular podcast, I will say. But apparently there's an army of helpers on your side, too. 150 different helpers, correct? Yeah, I work with about, now I work with about 250 spirit guides and guardian angels. And the thing about psychic ability that I just want to go back to, everybody's going to have different abilities. So to be able to talk to loved ones on the other side may or may not be your gift. Uh, clairvoyance may be your gift, which is clear seeing, seeing visions in your head before they happen. That would be clairvoyance or clairaudience is hearing voices in your head or outside of your head that other people can't hear. Or <clears throat> clairsentience, which is clear feeling, means feeling the emotions and feelings of other people, or some people call that empathic as a common term. So with your psychic ability, it's there's different gifts within that. And the same as if me and you went to art school, we took the same classes, had the same instructor. You know, you might come out drawing realism, and I might come out drawing abstract. We both have the same teachers, we took the same classes, but depending on our own unique talents and innate skills and abilities is going to really uh, influence how we paint. Same with psychic ability. Everyone's got different psychic ability. So when a person learns to develop their psychic ability, you know, why most people don't become very good psychics is because they try to develop what they're interested in, not what's their gift. So the most important thing in developing psychic ability is discovering first, what is your gift? Are you clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient? And once you discover that, then working on developing that more. Huh. It's like if if you had an eye for realism and I can't draw realism, no matter how, I might get okay at it, but I'll never be as good as you. But if I'm good at abstract and I develop that, I'll be a great abstract painter. So it's first discovering what your gift is. And you do that by working with an experienced psychic. You do that by working with a very good teacher. That's brilliant. So what you're trying to tell me is that maybe I got a gift, but I just haven't noticed it yet. Man, that's yeah, so exciting. Everybody, everybody's got, you've got a gift. You just don't know what it is. Everybody has psychic gifts. Everybody. Oh man, that's so exciting. So where do you, well, for lack of better terms, where do you get your juice from? Where does this stuff come from? Like there must be a, a another place where, where this information kind of has to travel from. Where, where is it coming from? Information. What, what's this juice, this stuff? Yeah. I like, mean, uh, 
psychic information. Like yeah, where, did, where does it all come psychically. from? <clears throat> We're in, so like a clairvoyant vision, like, for example, when I predicted the Oklahoma City bombing, where did that knowledge come from? Is that is that what you're asking? Yes, sir. Where did it come from? Or, OK, well, OK. Well, oh boy, that's a really that gets into a huge, big philosophical statement and or a conversation. But basically, in the most simplified way there is, <laughs> there is an energy field surrounding the entire universe. It's all part of this universe. And we are all individually connected to this energy field. This is a, I'm, I'm creating, trying to explain this in the most basic concept that I can, because this is a very, could be a two hour conversation. <laughs> and so we're, so for example, <clears throat> in the ability of the Oklahoma City bombing, for example, the people that were involved in doing that, thoughts are energy. You've heard that where attention goes, energy flows. I don't know if you've heard that, but thoughts are things. Maybe you've heard that before. Yes, sir. What we think we send out into the universe. And whatever's out there in the universe can be picked up. You know, there's voices above you right now. They're they're speaking Japanese. They're speaking Chinese. They're speaking African. They're speaking Italian. They're speaking German. And they're speaking English. But you can't hear them. If you have a ham radio, you can hear them. There's waves. There's waves up there going everywhere. There's Bluetooth waves that you can't see, but you can connect your computer to them. Mm -hmm. So our thoughts are like these another form of these waves that are out there that you need an instrument to tune into. Your instrument is your mind and your psychic ability. Your 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 ability psychic ability is is basically the ability to learn to tap into the invisible energy in the universe. As a radio taps into radio waves and then filters it through as music, you become the vessel that learns to, and developing psychic ability to tap into this energy that's out there. And it's teaching yourself how to be a receiver. It's teaching yourself how to be a receiver and how to share what you're receiving. So when the Oklahoma City bombing happened, Whoever would, when, when it, the people involved before it ever took place, they were transmitting energy. They were thinking about this before they ever did it. They were planning it. They didn't wake up one day and go, hey, let's bomb the Oklahoma City. Let's bomb the federal building. They planned it. They thought about it. Every one of those thoughts, ideas is being projected energetically out into the universe. So I, as a psychic, was tuned into that frequency, their frequency, and through that frequency, I was able to translate that or transmit that as a vision. I actually saw a vision of it happening. So I was picking up on the con. you know, think of this as like a, a group consciousness. Everybody involved was all planning the same thing, so they had one group intention, that was to bomb the building. I could tune into the energy of that group intention they sent out into the universe. And that's how I was able to see it and know it before it happened. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes great sense because, well. Okay, and, and the 90 minutes before, I, I actually had a dream about this. And then I just knew. I just knew when it was, I just knew. I, I, I just knew. I was tuned into that consciousness. It's kind of like me and you, like we had a plan, like today. You knew you were having me on, and I knew I was going to be on. So even though you're where you are and I'm where I am, we have a group consciousness. A con that group consciousness is, the idea is, Tana is going to, I'm going to be on his show. He's going to be on my show. Tana's going to be on my show. And it's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's projected out there. Yeah. So a psychic realistically could pick up, oh, Tana is going to be on this show with this guy, blah, blah, blah if they're tuned into that energy, because we've already created that and sent it out into the universe. So, so interesting to hear that process, you know, and, and that's something not a lot of people talk about. And uh, I'm so glad to hear that because I, I, I just love the process, how, how it can mm -hmm. happen, how you can get those visions, because let's be honest, you're a very, very special person, Tana, to be able to do that. And it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. What, what blows my mind though, is the idea that you have a 93% accuracy rate. So that just blows my mind. As soon as I read that, I was like, oh, my God, I've got to have this guy on my show. <laughs> because I was very – I'm sorry. 
please. Tell me, tell me a little tiny bit about how we came to that 93% accuracy rate. I mean, in my world, I'd imagine that might be a broad, shall we say, spectrum of things you've done, like predictions about what's going on in the world or maybe personal readings, stuff like that. Yeah, for, from clients, and I've been doing this for some 23 years, so ever wow. since I was, uh, you know, a baby, before I was ever born. <laughs> I'm only 21 now, so I've been doing it since I was in my mother's womb. And uh, (laughs) I wish that was the case. And so what happened is, uh, you know, through clients and through all the years, these are numbers that we've been able to to come up with. And and, and there there was one. So that's how that number came to be. It's just through many years of statistics and just knowing the numbers from the, the repeats. A lot of my clients continue to come back to me over and over. Of course, so, of course. Why wouldn't they? You're accurate. Oh my God, you have able. to. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing I wanted to say about what makes a, something people ask is what makes a psychic reading inaccurate or what makes a psychic prediction inaccurate. So remember when I talked about how we're we're tuned into this group consciousness and I'm going to be on your show and yes. I'm going to you're going to have me on the show and someone picks up on that, mm-hmm. but then all of a sudden I'm not on your show. Hmm. Well. That would make it then an inaccurate prediction if someone predicted it. What what caused it to be inaccurate? Maybe you got sick that day, and maybe we needed to reschedule. Yes. Maybe I got sick. Maybe my computer broke. So there are the thing for people to understand about psyche predictions is there are inaccuracies. What makes that? Why isn't Tana a hundred percent accurate if you can be ninety three? Because there are uncontrollable, unforeseen circumstances that can happen and those aren't contained in that group consciousness. Absolutely. We and all have what we... actually happen. Yeah. That's what can make predictions of psychics uh not very ac- not accurate or not happen at times. Yeah, I think that's or really... sometimes it could be a timing issue too. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point to make because, you know, for instance, like today, I could have woke up today and heaven forbid something happened to me. I could have fell down my stairs and broke my arm, something crazy, okay? You could have and something good have... and it didn't mean that it wouldn't have come true, but you know, I still think we all have free will, right? That's we, right. That's right? exactly. And we still have that free will. And it comes back to that free will a little tiny bit. And you know, I, I'd like to think in my life, there's this wonderful future ahead of me. There's beautiful gifts from, from wherever coming my way. It's all going to happen. But you know what? Sometimes I still get trapped in that stinking thinking bubble. And sometimes right. when that happens, I think I might push those gifts away. Tell me a little tiny bit about, uh, some of the things that you have predicted for other people. Like, um, oh. tell me a little tiny bit. Tell me probably one of the most joyful things you've ever predicted. I think that would be a real awesome thing to hear on my podcast. Well, some of the joy. Well, I, you know, one of the things that I tell people is people always say, oh, they're kind of afraid to have a reading sometimes with me. And I've never had a person hang up that didn't feel empowered. People never hang up with me feeling afraid and freaked out. There are psychics out there that they like to focus on the doom and gloom. And to me, I think that's a reflection of where a person is spiritually. I mean, if you're trying, if you're sending your clients away scared, that's, that's ridiculous because life is not all bad and fearful. So first of all, if you ever go to a psychic and it's all, you feel terrible when you hang up, that's because that psychic feels terrible about their own life. Don't come back to them. Um, but you should walk away from a psychic greeting, feeling empowered and work with good information. Doesn't mean you're not going to hear things you don't want to hear. Of course you will. But all in all, you should walk away with a good feeling because I tell people life is full of sunshine and rain. I prefer to focus on the sunshine. That's great. So, so my what is a well? I I, I can I can tell you I guess a, a, a funny kind of a not funny but um, some some what are some of the funny predictions. Uh, had a woman came to me one day and I knew I was having a reading with her and I knew she was so irritated. I used to, I don't see people in in person anymore because we for people all over the world now so i can't see people but when i used to way back when i used to see people in person and i kept telling her you know you're going to have, go, i said you're going to turkey you're going to turkey well i knew by the time the reading was over she was really livid i knew she thought i was probably the worst psychic in the world <laughs> and i knew she was upset when she left and i didn't know what to say because you know She's like, I brought it up a few times and she got that disgusted look on her face. <laughs> and I just thought, well, I can only tell you what, you know, I'm thinking to myself, woman, I can only tell you what I see, right? That's, that's right. So, Absolutely. Yeah. But anyway, I knew she, I said, well, she, well, thank you. You know, that she was kind of a little bit curt. Thank you. And she left. I know she felt like she got ripped off and didn't get her money's worth. 
So anyway, time passed about two months later, three months later. I get a phone call from this woman. Uh oh. Telling me how she wanted to apologize to me. She and she, she verified what I thought. She said to me, you know, when I was there I thought you were the biggest waste of money I ever spent in my life. I thought I I had waste I was so angry at you and she used the word pissed off. I was so I was never coming back to you again. She said, You kept saying about Turkey and I just thought that's the most ridiculous thing. I had no desire to go to Turkey. Well it turned out that her husband was a top salesman at this huge car dealership in Ohio. Huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a contest they were in. And the prize for the winner was a trip to Turkey. (laughs) Well, her husband won the contest and she (laughs) called me and said she was just letting me know that next week they're leaving to go to Turkey. (laughs) And and she became a long-term client after that. (laughs) You know, and you know what? I, I I'm so happy to hear that because there's a blessing and a burden in that in that reading, you know, and that and that's what life is all about. It seems like doesn't it, Tana? Like, does it ever occur to you that for every one of these burdens you might predict for someone, there's a blessing right behind it? That's right. You know, I always when people I say things to people sometimes they go, "Well, no, that can't be," and I always tell them, "Wait, I'm a psychic. Wait, remember, I am a psychic. I'm supposed to tell you things that you're not going to know about. So it can be just because you don't think it can be." That's it right. Can be. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so glad there's that positivity there with you. And I had that feeling because let me tell you, I don't attract the negative people when it comes to this podcast right. into my life. It just doesn't happen. I have I never had the negative happen. people. And you know what? There was maybe one or two people that were kind of blah and not feeling really yeah. good. And by the end of the show, they're like just beaming. Like I hear them through the phone. So that, right. that means the world to me. I guess that's my little bit of light work. From my you're end. sending a lot of love out. That's yeah. why you're attracted. And I'm the same way with my clients. I don't attract negative or weird clients. Okay. You know, some psych, you have some kooky butt clients. I don't. Oh, I think that's and wonderful. So, yeah, and that's why. You see, you're sending that energy out, that consciousness, that thought energy, and people are receivers. They're picking it up. You're only drawing and attracting to you people that are of a positive nature. And people that are of a different frequency or a more negative energy, they're going to be repelled. They won't even have a desire to be on your show. You know what keeps coming back in my mind right now? I know we talked about a little bit earlier about how the whole world is covered in, in basically communication going on all the time, and sometimes we can pick up on it. Um, mm-hmm. In my spare time, when, when I get a chance... I like to do a little bit of paranormal investigation. I like to go and work, do recordings and hopefully hear the uh-huh. voices of those who passed on. It's something I, I've wanted to do. And the one thing that keeps popping in my head is a piece of equipment I use called a spirit box. And this this idea okay. that it switches through radio stations and the white noise, sometimes we hear voices and responses to our questions. You know, what is your thought on, on that piece of equipment? Like, what is your thought on well, that? It might be a little, I'm not really sure if you're familiar with it or not, but the I'm whole idea, familiar, that whole thing, how it works. What's your idea I'm on that? With, EVPs, but I'm not, I don't know. I'm thinking that somehow involved with the spirit box. Yep. Never heard of the spirit box. It's interesting to me. Yeah. It, it literally sp- like just goes through really fast. <laughs> it's like a broken handheld radio, basically. And it's okay. very common to get like a blip in a blap where you can't hear someone. Okay. Okay. But every now and then you get things that are clear as day that comes through the white noise and you picks up on your recorder and like we're talking genuine responses, like right, of right, intelligent right. ones too. I'm wondering if that, I wonder if that spirit could be what we're picking up on here, and and does it actually have anything to do with what you're picking up on? Could Tana Hoy actually be his own version of the spirit box? I think it's just an absolutely, interesting idea. Absolutely, it could be. Absolutely, there. You know, we there are voices. We I believe in EVPs 100. percent I've gotten the I've got a very good EVP a few years uh, about 15 years ago. Very clear. I think it's called there's A, B, and C level. And I got an. I think they they classify them by clarity A, clear as B, and then C. Is that correct? A, B, C. Some people. To be honest with you, there's nothing written in stone when it comes oh, to the paranormal. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's well, so. It's I've heard a, different classifications. Yeah. I got an A. A like I'd say an A. Voice. Like in yeah. my mind, in my mind, I'm an EVP researcher myself. Is what I do. I, I only focus on the audio. It's my only focus. Yeah, yeah. I don't take pictures or anything like that. So when I go into a location like that. It's something to me that really wows me is what I call a made communication. It's multiple word, it's audible to the ear, it's intelligently communicated, and it's in direct response to what you're saying. So, for instance, I was at a client's house not too long ago. I won't name names, of course. And, uh, you know, we were running some gear and stuff like that. And her, her, actually her son had passed away a few years earlier. And she felt like her son was still around. And she had just 
had a piece of equipment out and stuff like that and was just talking and I left her alone, which is something I do a lot. I, I leave them there just to speak. You can imagine it's very personal what you want to say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was so, it was so interesting that she actually got a response that said, love you, mom. I'm okay. And what really blew me away was we didn't know we had that in real time. I went home and kind of found it in my audio when I edited it, brought it back to them. And when they listened, they said, Oh my God, that's his voice. So to me, that blows me away. Could this all be connected? Yes, absolutely. We don't die. What happens is, <clears throat> I'm a psychic and a medium, so what that means is that I have the ability not only to talk to spirit God, not only to pick, tell people things about their future, but the medium part, people think when they hear the word medium, it just means talking to the dead. It doesn't. A medium means to be the medium between, or the voice, between the earth plane and the spirit world. So if you can think of the spirit world above, the earth plane below, uh, uh, below and in the middle, the the center part, the medium, that's the medium, the, the transmitter between the two. So medium means uh, psychics don't have the ability to communicate with spirit guides, guardian angels, loved ones, fairies, elves. They just are only are able to tell you about the future using clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. If a person is a that's a psychic has the ability to communicate or talk with spirit guides, guardian angels, loved ones, then they are also have the gift of mediumship. Not all psychics are mediums. All mediums are psychics. Very interesting so, point. Yeah. So the mediumship, mediumship means you have a finely tuned body to pick up to these finer energies that I was talking to you about of the voices and things out there. You're like a fine-tuned radio. Think of your body becomes like a fine-tuned radio. So what happened is, yes, because we don't die. I mean, EVP is the, I'm the most skeptical psychic you'll ever meet. So I mm-hmm. am very psychic, but I'm very skeptical about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I had a guy one time who I believe to be a very honest person present me with some very impressive EVPs. Mm-hmm. I had no reason to question this guy, but you know, like I said, I'm a very skeptical psychic. And I thought, yeah, well, let's just see. Maybe this is real. It'd be great if it is. So I went on a ghost hunt and I was into ghost hunting for a while with this gentleman. And I actually got an amazing EVP. And then I knew for myself, this is very real. Right? Ah, and you know, isn't so, that interesting? Let me tell you something. A lot of people will even look at the world's most foremost psychic and say, yeah, he's not really the real deal until you predict something for them. <laughs> right, exactly, right? exactly. And a so, true skeptic so, is open-minded to the possibility. A skeptic has to be proven. They need to see the proof, and that's the difference. That's the difference. That's right. So EVPs, what they prove to me is they prove to me something very, very beautiful, and that is we don't die. <laughs> we can still communicate. We change form. Death is nothing more than the physical body the, the, the physical body dies. We all have a spirit. It's the spirit that goes on, and it's the spirit that's reincarnated. So when we die and we're reborn, our spirit is reborn into that body. So we are we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. So that just proves to me that that spirit does live on. And so, yes, it is definitely absolutely possible to communicate with people are on the other side. And an and a, a audio version of what I do where other people can hear is EVP. Yeah, that's a good point. That, that's actually, you know, I'm so glad I had this conversation today because now I feel like I'm more like Tana Hoy than I could have ever imagined on my own. <laughs> well, I tell people if you don't believe, you know, if you ever have fear about dying, if you ever have fear about death, Go into a room and just say, Mom, if you're there, I'd like you to leave me a message, or Dad, or if there's anybody out there that has a message for me, I'd just love to hear a message. And then leave that electronic recorder on for an hour, go. Come back in an hour. Now, you got to sit there. You know, if you don't have special equipment, you have to sit there, (laughs) turn on, just listen and listen and listen. Oh, yes. But I tell people, I guarantee you, if you do this consistently, you will eventually get a voice. You oh. will eventually hear something. Dana, Dana I, I think what I'll do for you, being on my show, and I'm going to send you a free copy of my book, and I think you're going to really like it. Just a Thank present you. for me to you, because it's all about EVP. Okay, Thanks. moving on a little tiny bit. We are growing short on time. Believe it or not, that was a half hour. 
I like, enjoy it. Where did the time go, right? But I, 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 got, I got two things I want to talk to you about before I let you go on. The first thing Please. is I want to talk to you about when you were on Psychic Detectives, okay, that show. Talk to me a little mm-hmm. bit about the double homicide murder that you helped solve. And tell me, kind of pick up the story about the moment you picked up a picture of who was involved. Okay, what happened, and first of all, how I even got onto that, was that I uh, I felt like I wanted to do something to give back to the community. I wanted to do something free to help people. I wanted to, I just wanted to help, use my gift to help. So I had a friend who was a reporter at ABC News, and I said, hey, if you have any police friends, if I call them and tell them I'm a psyche, they're going to think I'm crazy. And I was pretty well known in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm from, but I thought they're going to think, you know, I just let them know I'd be willing to help them. And then one day I got a call on the phone from her, and she said, they've got a case. It's a two-year-old cold case that's never been solved. You know from TV today, from the shows, if they're not solved in the first 48 hours, they never get solved. That's right. And so it was two years old, and it was the biggest unsolved crime in Columbus, Ohio. Well, I don't watch the news, and I don't watch the radio, and I, I just don't. It's too negative. So I didn't know anything about the case, and... She said, it's called the Macaulay case. Have you heard of it? I said, no. And she said, do you want me to tell you about it? I said, no, I don't want to know anything about it. I just want to go in, see what I get up, and see if I can help them. So that's how the journey began. So I met with this detective, and it was actually a sheriff's department. It wasn't a police department. No, but it was the sheriff's department in the town. They were handling the case, and turned out the guy had the, – the, 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 they, they didn't have a suspect. So when I went in – they were looking at the crime totally wrong. They thought it was a burglary, and they would never have solved it because they weren't even on the right track. It's like a, it's like a tracking dog sniffing the wrong trail. <laughs> so, so I went in, and right away I picked up. I said, "Hey, this is not a, this is not a, this was not a burglary. This was actually a mur. You know, this wasn't a burglar that came in and they were there and killed him. They thought a burglar came in, found him home, and killed him." And uh, because they were home and killed them to get away. And I said, no, 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 that's not what happened. So I told him this was actually a murder, someone intending this. So I remember they showed me the crime scene photos. And um, I saw this picture on the table, uh, on the crime scene photo of of a guy, or hanging on the wall on the crime scene photos. And I really focused in on that. And I started having all these visions. I mean... I worked with them a few days or a week, I forget, quite a while on this case, and I just kept getting visions of this little boy, this little boy, this little boy. And they kept telling me how this family was, you know, they were pillars of the society, they are very well loved, and they were very well cared about people, and everyone spoke glaring things about them. But that wasn't what I was picking up about these couples. And I was picking up some people that were mean, very mean to their children. And I kept seeing this little boy. And this little boy kept coming in. I I kept seeing this little kid talking to me through this whole thing. And I didn't quite understand who this boy was. Well, later in the show, you'll find out that the boy became, turning out, it was their son. And it was the son. They had been very verbally abusive. Well, according to the son. This, according to him, they had been very, and what I picked up psychically that I first saw before this, they were very verbally abusive to him. So it ended up being a situation where what they didn't talk about in the show was when the guy murdered his parents, and and the kid wasn't even a suspect at this point. The son had been cleared, he had an alibi, and I kept seeing, and I thought, you know, and eventually I realized it was the son, but they had, he was clean and clear. And so, but what he did is he married, he, when, when, after his parents died, he actually divorced, I think he was married. He ended up, must have divorced his wife, or I don't know if they divorced what. He ended up moving to Phoenix. So what happens if you want to commit a murder? You move away because police department in Columbus, Ohio, you know, in Phoenix, Arizona, where he moved, they have their own cases to worry about. So they're not worried about some crime from Ohio. So what happened is the sheriff's department had to fly there. And with their own funds and money, whenever they wanted to interview him. And he had a right to deny them an interview because he was not a suspect. Well, they went over there four times to interview him. Same story. And by the time I had come in, they had interviewed him four times. So it was the working with them on the case. 
And what I saw, I was actually able to get into his mind. I can get into people's minds and souls. Wow. So like if you have a soulmate or something, you don't know what they think or how they feel, or how someone cares, I can get inside them and tell you everything about what they're, what's going on, what they think, if they really like you or not. Well, I can also use this to get, I can use this, I can get into the minds of people and into their soul. And I can become that person. And uh, I know how they think and I can know how they feel. So I got into him, into this guy, and I said, no, 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 you're, this is your, you know, here's what you need to say to him. Here's what you need to do to him. This is going to get him to confess. And I was telling him, the guy, the sheriff looked at me and said, oh, my God, the stuff you're telling us is what they teach us in the academy. And I said, I don't know about the academy. I'm just telling you psychically what you need to do. <laughs> well, what they didn't talk about in the show was I actually told them how to interview this guy. They had one Lord. They, this is like a fifth time. They were done. Remember, this was over two years old at this point. They were pretty much, you know, at the point where it was never going to get solved. But they used what I told him. And they didn't mention that in the show. And that's what got him to confess. And then in the show, he says the words I told him in the show about his parents and the abuse and how that went. And in the interview, when he confessed, he actually said why he killed his parents is because they had been very abusive and mean to him as a child. Wow. So they, the, so it was through what I told them through getting inside. I told them how to interview it. And so <laughs> they did. And they, they got, that's how they got him. Wow. And what yeah. a great story. Like that alone, like I think everyone on the planet should hear that story before they have any kind of skeptical mind about psychics and their abilities. Cause you got the proof on paper, man. That's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's, it's a sad, don't get me wrong. It's a sad case to have to prove the world that you're the true psychic on. Don't get me wrong on that. No, I, no, I think no, it's I, horrible. No, no. And no, I can no, only I, imagine the mental toll that must have took on you, Tana. That must have been well, very I, hard. I, yeah, but I actually, I have learned to uh, not allow it to affect me. I've, I've, I've learned to view it as a, as a movie rather than taking in all that negativity because it could really affect me. Of course. And my psyche could build. So I've learned to be very, de you know, compassionate and caring, but detached, if that makes sense to you. Okay. We've come to the end. My okay. hand is shaking a little bit. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be <laughs> honest. Because I think that you really are the world's foremost psychic. So I'm oh, going to go ahead and I'm going to give you one opportunity, if you are comfortable with it. If you're comfortable okay. with it. I'm not going to force you to do anything here. But do you see anything about me? Well, you know, that's very interesting because you're, you're, you have a little bit of a skeptic side to you, too, about things. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that you're not open. But uh, when you got into this, were you a little bit skeptical? I was the most skeptical person on the planet. I actually came yeah. into being a paranormal investigator as an atheist, and now I'm a God-believing man. <laughs> That's right. That's so. what I mean. You you had a very skeptical side view when you got into this, but it was it was through your experience and doing things, you know, and and seeing these things that you became more of a believer. That's right. So this is something that I pick up very strong. You came into this life. This was part of your journey. You are, when you said about spreading or sending light into the world, you actually are a light seeker. You're actually a light giver. You were involved in some, as a matter of fact, you were involved. Your, your journey began back in Egypt. Wow. You had a, a very strong lifetime in Egypt where you were very into the mystical and the mysterious. And you were practicing what they would have called a magician then. Hmm. And then you went through some lifetimes where you actually, you know, you were born in the dark ages at one time and you were very oppressed and you were told this stuff was evil and of the devil. So you kind of shut it down. And then you had another lifetime in Ireland where you were still oppressed. And then you come into this lifetime and now you, you carried that, that skepticism came from all that oppression and those other lives in between your one, your first one in Egypt that I was talking about. And this life is about rediscovering it and understanding it and reconnecting with the spiritual again. Wow. It's like a circle that's come full loop. Are you married? Yes, I am. <laughs> Are you guys planning a child? We have two children right now and a little baby already. He's a, just a little over one year old. 
Okay, are you planning a third child? Yes, a very special third child, actually. Yeah, because I see a third child being born to you. Ah. So this isn't your last two kids. You got one more. <laughs> well, it's interesting you should say that because me and my wife right now are right in the middle of a fostering situation where we're planning on actually having me as a foster parent stay at home to look after a kid and, and give them some of the breaks they might not get without a proper figure there. That's a, you may you may end up adopting this child. <laughs> I would think that would be the uh, the plan eventually, yeah. <laughs> That's where so there is a because I saw a third child, I didn't see it born through your wife, but I saw a third child. That's what confused me. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. So there's gonna be this third child in your family. Wow. Oh man, that the chills are going through me, man. That's crazy. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> Uh, some people say I'm psychic. <laughs> <laughs> it freaks me out because nobody knows about that. that. That's so wild. Oh, man. I I'm so glad I got a chance to meet Tana Hoy today. This is great. I'm, I'm glad I got what to. A, what too. a beautiful oh. moment. And it's so reassuring to me because let me tell you, right now we've just been, oh, it's been a hard go of it the last year. I'm not going to lie. And uh, I know that this this fostering opportunity, really, they, they've taken this, this fostering opportunity and, and turned it into a job. They, they right. pay you now to take these children and give them to be that parent. Right. And so right. I get to do something really great and also be able to provide for my family. So it's right. It's something I've been waiting for forever. And, uh, you know, the waiting is, is very wearing. But to hear your voice and say that today, that's just, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm just, I can't shut up. But now I got to shut up because <laughs> it's the end of the <laughs> oh. show, guys. Tana Hoy, the world's foremost psychic. And I got proof of it. <laughs> Tana, um, your website. So oh, people yeah, can my come. My website is tanahoy.com. It's T A N A H O Y.com. So if they ever want to schedule a private reading or learn more about me, they can go to my website. And uh, yeah, I'd love to and get on my newsletter, join my inner circle, become part of my newsletter. And uh, I'll send you my monthly predictions and my horoscopes and my money horoscope and love horoscope and monthly horoscope and psyche predictions. Come to you every month for free. Wow. That's great. Well, guys, check him out. Tana Hoy, thanks so much for being on. Hey, thank you. I had a really great time. I appreciate it. Well, the time to say goodbye is upon us. But don't worry. You can keep track of the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast very easily. It's available on Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, and TuneIn Radio. Just look for the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast banner. Of course, if you'd like to keep up to date, you can always check out the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast Facebook page, drop a like, and every single time a new show goes up, you'll be notified. You can also follow me, John Mallard, on Twitter at O-D-D-T-O-N-F-L-D. -D -D -E. That's Odd to Newfoundland. Get your latest news on the podcast as well as the ever-popular Parajoke of the Day. From the oldest city in North America, I bid you adieu. From the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast.